Praise God. It is so good to see you this morning. I appreciate you being in God's presence today. Amen. It is exciting to be together with our spiritual family. My name is Pastor Mark, lead pastor here, and we are just excited to welcome you to be part of our family today. So God bless you. We got a lot of great things that are happening, and uh, I'm ready to dive into the Word of God today. And I know some of you are wondering, why are we going to take our offering? We are going to take our offering. It's going to be at the end of service today. Is that all right? All right, because you need the Word in you, and I believe you're going to be able to uh, get uh, get the Word alive inside of you today. So we are in the middle of a series that we have entitled, I Hate to Ask. And this series is basically what we are talking about questions that people are afraid to ask. And you know, the unfortunate thing is, there's a lot of people that come to church that don't know why we believe what we believe, but they are afraid to ask. They're afraid to ask because somebody is going to think that they're ignorant or that they're going to get judged. Isn't it, isn't it sad that the house of God is one of the places you get judged the most? That is not the way it's supposed to be. And so what we are doing is we are covering some of the subjects that we want to answer the questions that you have. So I invite you this morning as we get into the word today to turn with me to Second Timothy chapter number three. Second Timothy chapter number three. Second Timothy chapter number three. And um, <clears throat> I've been kind of having a head cold the last few days, and so my voice is a little raspy. So I told the team I may preach more like a Presbyterian than I do a Pentecostal today. <laughs> so bear with me if you will, but I believe by the grace of God, there's healing. Amen. So 2 Timothy chapter number 3, one more time, I invite you to stand as we honor the Word of God today. 2 Timothy chapter number 3, if you are able to stand as we read together, and I'm going to begin reading in verse number 14. 2 Timothy chapter number 3 in verse number 14. If you have it, say Amen. Here we go. Paul the Apostle writing to young Timothy, and this is what he tells him. He said, continue thou in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom you have learned them, and that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture. Everybody say the word all is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. So I believe that we're living in a day when we need the Word of God more than we have ever needed His Word. We need clarity because there is a lot of confusion that is in the world today, and a lot of confusion in the church world as well. There's a lot of things that are being said across platforms around the country that are bringing spiritual confusion. And I want to stand before you today and bring clarity about where there is confusion. And the question that I want to answer today is how do I know that the Bible is the Word of God? You know, David said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And the reason that I want to cover this today is because there is a lot of uh, confusion regarding some of the religious writings that are out there that many have equated or paralleled to the Word of God. 
There's some that say, why can't we mix the Word of God with other religious writings or teachings? You know, what about the Koran? What about uh, Chinese literature? What about uh, some of the ancient writings of prophets and seers that have been in centuries past? And really, within even the personal development industry that is out there, there's a lot of speakers that will put the Bible at the same level as some of the other religious teachings because they are good sayings or they are principles that lead one to a greater life, greater relationships. And even within the church, we've got many that will use the Word of God and manipulate it in such a way as to promote an ideology or maybe a way of life that they are promoting within the body of Christ. And I've said this before that I believe that there is probably as much, if not more, motivational speaking that is going on in the church as there is preaching of sound doctrine. And I believe that we're living in a day church that we need to have the preaching of sound doctrine so that we can be the people that God wants us to be. Can somebody shout amen to that? Amen. Because again, the Bible is clear that this is what's going to happen in the last days. Look what Peter said in Second Peter chapter number 2. He said there's going to be false prophets among the people and there will be false teachers among you who will bring in damnable heresies, even denying that the Lord bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth is is evil spoken of. And through covetousness, uh, they with feign words will make merchandise of you. I underline that because there are people that are making big money. They are making merchandise of teaching things that seem to be the truth, but yet they are manipulated and they are twisted by a human ideology or thought process. And I want to make a pledge before God and before you, that by his grace, I want to give you the pure, unadulterated, and unfiltered word from Almighty God, so that you can be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Amen. Because that is what's so important today. And it's not popular, and I understand that, and it's not one that may bring in a lot of money. But we are living in a day when experience has been placed above the written word of Almighty God. You ever been on YouTube and seen all the prophecies that are out there that are so wacky that don't line up with the word of God? You better be careful who you listen to. Even if they say, and I'm not saying that there have been some that God has allowed to see heaven, but there are some that have said they've gone to heaven that are saying some weird stuff that does not line up with this book right here. And that's why Peter said this, or Paul said this, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have received, let him be accursed. Paul said, even if you get an angelic visitation, If it that visitation and revelation does not line up with what the Bible said, that so-called angel is to be accursed. Every false cult, that just about every false cult that has ever begun, begins with a shred of truth that is interwoven through a bunch of human lies. And many of them have received an angelic visitation. How many have ever heard of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? You know, big tabernacle, big choir, Salt Lake City, the Mormons. In 1820, Joseph Smith went out into the woods 
to spend time alone, and a great pillar of light came to him. And he supposedly received a visitation from God and Jesus, who were both telling him how disgruntled they were with religious, uh, uh, just the, the, the differentiation in religion. And three years later, in his bedroom, a great light came into his room, and an angel came to him. Moroni, the angel, came and said that God had a great work for him. And this angel led him to uncover a book of golden plates that were buried near a hill here, a hill near his home. And as he uncovered these golden plates, the angel gave him the ability to interpret what was in these plates or in this book. And these seer stones were given him, and it led him to create the Book of Mormon, which is entitled literally Another Testament of Jesus Christ. And now you have Mormons all over the world. But I want to tell you something. I don't care what angel appeared to him. That was not an angel from God because you cannot add to that which God has already spoken. And I don't care what supernatural revelation somebody may come and say that they have received. Your supernatural experience will never supersede the written word from Almighty God. Come on, somebody needs to shout amen to that. And we're living in a day we've got to ground ourselves, even in the charismatic movement. And we need to deny any teaching that does not implicitly and completely line up with this Bible, the book. And we've got to understand that if we are going to be strong in the Lord, we are going to be strong because we are grounded in the word of Almighty God. Amen. So we're seeing a lot of young people that are leaving the church and leaving Christianity because they are seeking after a higher authority than the word of God. And again, Paul told Timothy, he said, this is going to happen that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith and they will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And I believe that we are seeing this exodus because we have made believing what the Bible says an option. Listen, this is not an option. This is thus saith the Lord. And when God speaks, do not put a question mark where God puts a period. And when God says it, it will be done. Amen. So how do we know? that this is the heart of God. How do we know this is the plan of God? Number one, we believe the Bible is the word of God because of its inspiration. We believe that it is the word of God because of its inspiration. We read the text this morning where the Bible said that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, the word inspiration is translated from the Greek word theonoustos. Theo meaning God and noustos meaning to breathe or neo to breathe. So literally what we believe is that the Bible is the breath of God that by the Holy Spirit was breathed on men and they wrote as of the Spirit dictated to them what to write. Peter agrees with this as we read in 2 Peter chapter number 1 where the Bible said the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So we believe that God supernaturally guided the authors of the Bible to write exactly what God wanted to communicate to you and to me. Now, the reason I have to say that is because this is not, this book that we have is not just a, um, it's not just a, what can I say, an idea of what God wanted. It's not just man putting down just their thoughts about what God wanted. We believe that every word that is in the scripture is divinely breathed by the Holy Ghost and that God communicated exactly what he wanted it to be said and these men wrote under the supernatural guidance of the spirit of God. Do you understand what I'm saying today? Amen. We believe in the verbal plenary 
inspiration. Verbal, obviously meaning spoken. God spoke and plenary means complete. What you hold in your hand is the complete, the full word of God. And that means every part of the Bible is equal in divine origin and equal in authority. Anytime you open this book, you have to understand you are holding the authoritative word that comes from Almighty God. And that's why when we read the word in church, we stand in honor of the word of the Lord. Amen. This is not somebody that just came along with a bunch of good ideas. This is the heart of God that is revealed unto you. Amen. Now, the reason that is so important, I understand that the Bible is written in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, and I don't know many people who know how to read Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. And so, and if you do, God bless you, but I know I don't. But we have to take an English interpretation of the original manuscripts that were written by the men of God of old. And so we need to be careful and find an English translation that is as close to the word-for-word -word manuscript as we possibly can. And I understand there are a gazillion translations that are out there. But at the end of the day, we need to find one because I believe in the original, every word was inspired by God. Now, the beautiful thing is God used the personalities of the writers in a different way. You're going to see grace come out of John. You're going to see uh, doctrine come out of... They, God, God used the personality of the writers, but that does not take away from the fact that in the original, every word is inspired by God. Let me tell you something, church. You don't pick and choose what you want to believe. Uh, listen, if it is in the Word of God, we believe it from cover to cover, Genesis uh, to Revelation every single verse we cannot say I'm going to scratch that out I'm going to take that out I'm going to cut that out listen this is God's heart in it in its entirety we must stand upon every word amen now you might ask you know pastor what do you say about translations and that's a very difficult thing to do because there are many good translations but i and this is my this is my opinion and so you can take it you can do your own research but looking at translations that are the closest to a word for word a translation from the original english standard version new american standard king james version i believe those are the three that rise to the top and again i'm not telling you what translation to read, but what I'm telling you is that you need to be very careful when man tries to add his idea into the inspired word of God. We need to find people that are saying, you know what? I don't care what you think. I don't care what I think. All I care is what God said, and I believe that every word is breathed by the Holy Ghost, and I'm going to stand on it in faith. Amen. It's inspired. And that is why we revere, that is why we honor the word of the Lord. Now, number two, we believe the Bible is the word of God because it is inerrant. It is inerrant. There is absolutely no error in the word of God. None. It is the only piece of literature that you can completely and wholeheartedly trust. Psalmist said in Psalm 19, he said, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, and the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord, they are right, rejoicing the heart, and the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Solomon said in Proverbs 30, he said, every word of God is pure, and he is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not to his word unless he reprove you and you be found a liar. Let me tell you, the purity of the word of God needs absolutely nothing added to that. Come on, somebody shout amen. When God said it, there is absolutely no discrepancy 
Because Numbers 23 said that God is not a man that he should lie. And neither is he the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said it, and will he not do it? Hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? You consider, the Bible was written over 1,600 years. 40 different authors. There were authors that came from a variety of backgrounds. Some were kings, some were priests, some were shepherds. uh, Written in such a variety of places, caves and palaces and prisons. Uh, But in all of the, uh, in all of the, uh, the variety of backgrounds and the span of years and the personalities uh, and the diversity of the personalities that were used, there is not one error and there is not one discrepancy that you will find within the confines of this book. And I believe that attributes to the character of the God that I serve. Because friend, we've got to believe that Jehovah is the one true God. And in him there is no flaw. In him there is no error. He is faithful. He is loving. He is kind, he is true, he is everlasting, and he will stand by his word. And my friend, when somebody comes and tries to fill your head with lies, you go to the word and say, thus saith the Lord, because it is the truth that Jesus said is going to make you free. Come on, somebody shout amen. Glory to God. Amen. I'm going to say I know there's a lot of good people that are doing a lot of good things in counseling and in the areas of working with emotional and mental health. And we have Celebrate Recovery every Sunday here at 4 p.m. where people can come and talk about the hurts and the hang-ups and the habits of their life. And I encourage you to come and be part of that. But at the end of the day, amen, it's not going to be a counselor that sets you free. It's not going to be an advocate that sets you free. It's not going to be a psychiatrist that sets you free. It's not going to be medication that sets you free. Amen. You can be medicated the rest of your life and live in the prison of mental and emotional illness. It is the truth of the word of God that is going to liberate your soul out of the emotional bondage that the enemy has you in. And that's why I'm preaching the word to you today because God wants you to be free. Somebody shout amen. Oh, hallelujah. I'm telling you the best therapy you can get is to get into the house of God on a Sunday morning and sit under good Bible preaching that is anointed by the word of God. And it's not me. It is the Holy Ghost that is speaking the truth into your life. And maybe you have swayed. Maybe you have veered. Maybe you've stepped out of the will of God. I'm telling you today, step back into the word and get your nose back into the word of God and let the truth of his word set you free. Amen. Glory to God. Yes, we can give you counsel. And we will do so by the grace of God according to his word. And I believe that today what you and I need more than anything is just a revival of the word of God again. I said what we need more than anything is just a revival of the word of God again. I believe in the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. I believe in all of that. It is it is biblical. But brother, what happened is we got so far into the side of the manifestation and goofy things started to happen. And believe me, I've been in this thing all of my life. My wife and I have seen it all. We've seen people do crazy stuff and blame it on the Holy Ghost. Come on now. I've seen people bust pews in the church and say, well, I was under the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you something. The Holy Ghost doesn't bust a pew in the church. Oh, come on now. I'm going to get off my notes here in just a minute, and I'm going to preach to you. 
The Holy Ghost is not going to make you do anything that is not decent and in order. I've seen people that have been on leashes being led around the altar like a dog saying they're under that. That's a lie. That is not the Holy Ghost. That is an, that is some demonstration from the enemy. And what's happened is we have, we have so sided on the side of manifestation that we have, we have gravitated too far away from the written revealed word of God. I believe there needs to be a balance between the truth of the word of God and the the manifestation of the Holy Ghost because brother it's not one or the other it's both when you walk in truth how many believe the Holy Ghost is going to move somebody shout amen hallelujah glory to God somebody said it's all if all you have is the word you're going to dry up if all you have is the Holy Ghost you're going to blow up but if you have both you're going to grow up and that's what I desire out of this body, out of this church. Amen. Sound Bible preaching, but also a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And Pastor Spencer, I appreciate what you said today. Amen. My friend, we can't grieve the Spirit by coming in and acting like we're just going through the motions. We've got to allow, amen, the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. And we've got to allow Him to move. And brother, that's why I encourage you, when you come to worship, lift up your hands, open your heart, and allow the Holy Ghost to move in this place. Because he can do more in five minutes than I can do in five hours. But we've got to have a balance. It is the inerrant word of God. It is the truth that's going to set your marriage free. It is the truth that's going to set your mind free. It is the truth that's going to deliver you out of addiction. It is the truth of the Word of God that is going to get your feet set back on the path of living in the way that God wants you to live. You've got to get back in the Word. And don't just pull a little promise out of the promise box and say, that's my verse for the day. No, open up your Bible, open up your iPhone, whatever you use, and read the Word. Digest the Word. Get it inside of you. Glory to God. I said it last week. Paul's problem with the Hebrews, he said, you should be teaching. And he said, you're still drinking milk. You should be on the meat of the word. And church, what I'm encouraging you this morning, I believe many of you, some of you, you have, you have, you have allowed other things to take away that time that you had in the word of God, that delegated time that you set everything else aside and you begun to study and to read the word of God. And now you're too busy. You've got so many things that are going and now you grab a verse here, grab a verse there. Maybe watch a little app here and there. Let me tell you, the word of God ought to be a daily discipline in your life. And brother, you can miss YouTube. You can miss uh, whatever TV show you watch, uh, but don't miss what the word of God has to say, because that's what's going to set you free this morning. Uh, amen. The word of God is complete. Be careful of cults that add books and commentaries to the Bible as if they are inspired. God was very clear about adding to his word in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 18. I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man will add to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man will take away from the words of the book of this prophecy... God will take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. Do you believe that's what God meant when he said that? And so don't add, don't allow anyone to add anything to what God has said. This is the truth in and of itself. Can I hear an amen to that? Number three. We believe that the Bible is the Word of God because of its infallibility. Inerrant 
means that it is incapable of error. Infallible means that it is incapable of failure. (laughs) Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. God is going to accomplish absolutely everything that he said in this book without exception. Next week, by the grace of God, I'm going to be preaching about the rapture of the church. And I believe that if the Bible teaches that Jesus is coming again, brother, you better mark it down and don't let any false teacher try to convince you otherwise. If Jesus said, behold, I come quickly, uh, you better believe he's coming quickly. You bring somebody with you next Sunday. That's what I'm going to be preaching on. But the word of God, amen, will accomplish everything that God said that he would do. Isaiah 55, the Lord said, my word, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It will not return unto me void, but it will accomplish that which I please, and it will prosper in the thing whereto I send it. If God said it, he will do it. Can I say that again? If God said it, he will do it. Look at your neighbor say, he meant what he said. <laughs> he meant what he, if God said it, he's going, listen church, I believe it's time for us to get our faith in what God said back and not let our experience, uh, amen, dominate our faith. Jesus is in the wilderness. He's the son of God. The devil comes, tempts him to turn uh, a stone into bread. What does Jesus say? Does he debate? Does he get into an argument? No. He said, it is written. (laughs) Jesus stands on the bow of the boat. And as the storm is swirling around, amen, what does he do? Does he debate? No. He speaks to the storm. It is his word that changes the environment. Church, what I'm telling you this morning, I believe that some of you are facing a situation right now that in the human understanding, it seems impossible. And you're looking at this and you're saying, Lord, I don't understand. Why in the world am I going through this? And you're looking up and you're saying, Lord, I don't understand what is going on. But you got to remember, God said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than yours and my ways higher than your. Can I tell you how many know God knows what he's doing? And when I don't understand, what do I do? I come back to the word of God and I say, Lord, I know I'm, I, listen, I, I know I don't understand why my child is sick, but your word said that with your stripes, I am healed. And so therefore I am believing what your word said. And I am going to speak the word of God over my child. I'm going to speak the word of God over my marriage, over my home, over my finances, over my job. Because brother, when you speak the word, of God, something in the environment changes because there is power and there is authority in the word of God. Amen. Through faith, we understand Hebrews 11 said that the worlds were framed by the word so the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And so the question is then, if the word of God is incapable of failing and that every, no, let me back up. How many believe that God will do everything he said in this book right here? I said, how many believe that God will do everything he said in this book right here? So then the question is, why do people not see the word of God achieved in their life? And I believe the word of God gives us the answer. Because Hebrews 4 and 2, Paul said, unto us was the gospel preached. But it was also preached to them. But the word preached did not profit them. Why? Because it was not mixed with faith in them that heard it. Come on now. Two people 
can read the same passage and one person can walk away and receive the promise of that passage and the other person walk away disappointed and the only difference is one person chose to believe what was written over how they felt and the other person chose to believe how they felt over what was written are you hearing what I'm saying <laughs> Okay, I didn't mean to use this illustration. We're having tacos for lunch today. And last night I was mixing up the meat. And I like Taco Bell. It's not good for me, but I like it. So what did I do? I went online. And I looked up the recipe for Taco Bell I hope it's meat that they serve. There's some debate about that. But I looked up online, what is the recipe for Taco Bell and their taco meat? And I found it. And so I'm getting all these spices out, got flour out. They even put sugar in. I put sugar, their sugar out. So I had all these things out sitting on the counter. Now, you'd have thought I was crazy if I'd have stuck a tablespoon in that flour, took a big old bite of that flour. Or you'd have thought I was crazy if I took a big old tablespoon of garlic salt, down that garlic salt. I could go through all, there was a whole thing that I had set out on the counter. All different ingredients. And you see, individually, we would never, ever eat those ingredients. But when you mix them together, it brings out a product that I hope is going to be good. I haven't tasted it. Well, I did taste it. It's going to be good. But it was the mixing together. You see, the reason that some people never receive anything from God, it's because they read the Bible, but they never take their faith and mix it with what is written. Because when you take your faith and mix it with the empowered and authoritative word of God, something is going to begin to move in your life. And the environment of your heart and your mind is going to change. Why? Because your faith is what activates the power of the word of God in your life lives. Come on, somebody. I know some of you say, why didn't God just do this? I'll tell you why. Because he's waiting on you to activate your faith in what he has said. That's why Romans chapter, no, let me, Jesus is the one that said, he said, Mark 11. He said, have faith in God. Because I say, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things which he says will come to pass. He is going to have whatever he, what? Whatever he says. So what is Jesus? He is teaching us. Okay, we have the inspired word of God. We know that it is breathed on by the Holy Ghost. We have the inerrant word of God. We believe that every word is true. Now we must believe that we have the infallible word of God. And if we believe that it will not fail, then I will speak the word out. And when I speak the word out, I am exercising my faith over my my feeling, and that is when God will do everything that he said. Come on, somebody, if you get it, shout amen. Hallelujah. Paul said, the word is nigh you, even in your mouth. I believe that it is time for you to start speaking the word of God over your life. And you to begin to stand on what God has said. And for you to begin to speak it out in faith. And when you speak it out in faith, something is going to happen within you and just as the Holy Ghost breathed on these men, 
How many believe that same Holy Ghost can breathe on you when you speak the word of God? Come on, somebody shout amen.